All right, we're going to address the, the Feast of Dedication over uh, today and probably maybe another week or two. I don't think I can get it all in today. But would you open your Bibles up to John chapter 10? John chapter 10. In verse 22, we read these words. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem. And it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now I'm going to stop right there for a moment because there would be no temple for Jesus to walk in had it not been for the events of about 150 years prior of the Feast of Dedication that is spoken of here, better known to most of the world today as Hanukkah. And when expressing or sharing the story of Hanukkah or celebrating the, the uh, Feast of Hanukkah, many times people focus on the story of the oil, a story that is not necessarily verifiable that the oil uh, burned for eight days after only having enough for one. And in so doing, I believe we miss the real significance of the events that took place that are celebrated now as Hanukkah. And the real significance is the courage and the faith of one family, a remnant family. Uh, the story of Mattathias, the Asmonean, Asmonean's family, in the English, his sons were named John, Simon, Mathis, Judas, Maccabeus, or Judas the, the Hammer. That's where we get the name Maccabees, Judas Maccabee, or Maccabeus, and Eliezer. Those were the five sons of Mattathias. And I want you to hear the words recorded by Josephus, spoken to his sons about the need to do something. He says... It was better for them to die for the laws of their country than to live so ingloriously as they then did. Now, if we look at that in the, its context, what was Mattathias talking about? It not, uh, not laws per se, that the way we look at them, but the Torah. The Torah was the law. The Torah was the constitution, so to speak, of this province of Judea or of Israel throughout time after it was given, the Torah. So you could better translate this and say it was better for them to die for the Torah than to live the way they were living under the oppression. And I'm not going, this isn't going to be a history lesson today. I might spend a little bit more time on that maybe in, a, in a, another week. But just so in case you've never heard of the events of Hanukkah, what was happening, this was during a period, again, about 150 years prior to Jesus. The Greek Syrian army led by Antiochus Epiphany had decimated the region. And what was happening to the Jews as they were assimilating into Hellenistic Greek thinking, Greek ways, and not only that, worse than that, it was a very intentional attempt by Antiochus Epiphany to wipe out, to eradicate any remembrance of the Jewish people by making laws such as no Sabbath worship, no new moon celebration, which was the way that the Jewish people understood the appointed times, the feasts during the year, no circumcision, and maybe the worst yet, desecrating the temple, S slaughtering swine on the altar and worshiping Jupiter. So you had this, this case of almost a disappearance of the Jewish people once again. We know, because we serve a faithful God, that that will never happen. But it always seemed to come to this. A people trying to destroy the Jewish people. Why? Because we know from the beginning, at the time that God cut covenant with Abraham, that demonic forces have desired to destroy the plan of God by destroying his people. Amen? Yes, and so that by, when I was meditating on the events of this week, 
I couldn't help but see history playing out once again. And just so that you know, just for the record, the General Assembly that met on November 29th, 2012, had 188 voting members. Of that 188, 41 countries abstained and 138 nations voted to acknowledge Palestine as a state, an observer non-member state. And only nine, nine nations said no. You take away Israel and you take away the United States and thank God we voted this way. Sadly, the very next day we condemned Israel for allowing building permits to go out for Jerusalem. And I don't, I'm not going to say, as the press would say, Arab East Jerusalem. There's no such thing. It's Jerusalem Amen. that Arabs live in also. It's not a settlement. It's Jerusalem, and they are building as they should in there and in Judea and Samaria. But thank God we voted no. And if you take away Israel and you take away the United States, only seven other nations voted no. And one of them, as we have our contingency coming back from Panama, one of them was Panama. Thank God. Thank God. But I thought of, as I was contemplating this, how they are almost alone, the words of Balaam. Remember Balaam hired to curse Israel? And he couldn't. He could only say what God would have him to say. And he said to over Israel in Numbers 23, verse 9, a people dwelling alone, Israel will never be reckoned among the nations. Never reckoned among the nations. They are set apart for the purposes of God. Amen? Amen. And through our faith in this Messiah of Israel, we have become a part of her. Therefore, we too have become in the midst of Israel and not reckoned among the nations. We may be living in the nations, but we are not of the nations. We may have American citizenship, but we have a greater citizenship. Amen? Amen. Amen? Not only in heaven, but even literally in the midst of our brothers and sisters in Israel. So I thought about three areas I wanted to talk about. And again, no way to get them all in in this message. But the remnant taking a stand and counting it all joy in the process. I thought of, secondly, the restoration and rededication process. We witnessed the rededication of Jerusalem in 1967. Those of us who are alive to see that and remember that. And, of course, Jerusalem itself. And I might break all those down into to separate messages. Today I want to focus on the authority that, and for the sake of, of the rest of the message, we'll call them the Maccabees, okay? This family. But what authority did they act in? They acted in the authority of God's Word. They acted in the authority of Torah because they knew the rightful owners of this land, bequeathed to them by God. And in Yeshua's day, once again, Israel was risking annihilation and assimilation because they had, there was this lacking of attention to the authority of God's word and more attention being placed on the authority in man. That's what's going on here as we continue in John chapter 10 when he chastises the leadership of the day. The authority in man had been elevated above God's word. And before I read this, before we get too hard on the Jewish leaders of this day, I want you to remember two things. One, thousands upon thousands of Jewish people of his day and shortly thereafter came to, to a reconciled uh, relationship with their God because of what Yeshua did and said and, then, and subsequent teachers afterwards. Thousands. He's addressing those who didn't see it. But again, before we get too hard on those who didn't see it, the Christian church 
is far more guilty of forgetting the authority of the Torah than the Jewish people ever will be. You follow me? So before we're too hard on them, as we put context to this story, I'm going to continue in verse 24. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Yeshua answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. But because they misunderstood what he was saying, they wanted to stone him. Believing that this was a, a, a blasphemous statement, uh, that he was some type of God separate from his father. And of course, you know, a Jewish person, a faithful Jewish person would never accept any other God but the God of their fathers. So they misunderstood what he was saying, what he was saying, that he was walking in the perfect authority of his father. That he was one in purpose and in mind with his father. And as he walked that out, he was trying to convey to them, and you don't have to turn to Matthew chapter 7, but that chapter tells us a lot about a remnant people. Because in Matthew chapter 7, he describes, Jesus describes the way as difficult. A narrow gate and difficult is the way, he said. And he said, few find it. That doesn't sound like that broad, all-encompassing way to God, does it? He says, few find it. And it's difficult. That speaks to this message. This speaks to this remnant, the Maccabees that I'm talking about today. And it speaks to us. Because it goes on, he says that there will be many who will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all these wonderful things in your name? And his response, Yeshua's response is so important. He says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness or Torahlessness. I never knew you. Those, that is, that's got to be the most frightening words within the scripture for those of us who are seeking to know this precious God in every way. Depart from me, I never knew you. But he gives us the reason. Just as the Greek army was trying to destroy any connection to the Torah and his people so that they could assimilate or annihilate them, so too would the enemy have you forget your authority in God that's found in the Torah and go your whole life ignorant of his desires and his wills, his will for your life. And face him and he say, I don't know you because you didn't, you didn't follow my will for your life. You didn't follow my ways. You see, he was speaking, and, that, and again, that chapter concludes, Matthew 7, verse 28 and 29, concludes with, they recognized that this man was speaking in authority. They said they were astonished that he taught as one having authority and not as one of the scribes that they were used to hearing. Because what they were hearing from the scribes of the day, the teachers of the day, was that if you belong to, let's say, for example, you belong to the camp or the teaching of Hillel. You spoke in the authority of Hillel. If you belong to the camp of Shammai, you spoke in the authority of Shammai, the rabbi, the leading rabbis of the day. And that's where you placed your trust in their word and spoke in their authority. And Jesus didn't do that. He didn't speak in someone else's authority. He spoke boldly in his own because he was perfectly aligned with his father's authority and will. And they recognized that. He didn't have to speak in someone else's name. He spoke in first person. He took a stand 
And he desired to bring continued revelation of who his father was. And see, that's the story that was going on here all along. I want to tie you into the Torah here a minute. And those of you who are here Friday night, bear with me. I want to repeat what I shared on Friday night. But God brought his revelation to mankind at Sinai, did he not? Initially? When Moses came out of Egypt, he was coming out of a worldview of paganism. See, we think of Bereshit or Genesis as the beginning and no, nothing else existed. But that was recorded, that was documented by Moses. And by then, there was a world of paganism that had gone on for thousands of years. There were wor sun worshippers. There were worshippers of creation. The river, the Nile River, insects, animals. All these things were being worshipped in the worldview of Moses. The worldview, the culture that he lived in was one of coming out of that and documenting God's desires. So when God tells him to record the creation events, what does he do? He tells him that the light exists. And four days later, in the fourth day of creation, the sun and the stars and the moon are created. Why? As footnotes. Why? To tell the sun worshipers that I am sovereign over them as well. Those who are worshiping the sun and when God records the creation, they are footnotes in his creation. Amen? Amen? And so on. As he goes, as he brings his people out of Egypt, what does he do? He systematically shows his sovereignty over every god of the Egyptians. Everyone. And continues to show that he is sovereign over all things, continuing through Yeshua. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But I want you to recognize that that's the authority, his sovereignty, that the Maccabees were operating in. They understood the Torah. The Torah gave specifics about creation, about the sovereignty of God, and then gave direction on how they should live their lives. All other people on the planet were guessing, well, the river is overflowing this year, the Nile God must be happy. Or, or I've got a frog in my, in my tub. He must be, the, the, the frog God must be upset with me. Or, I, or my child is sick. What did I do? Did I, did I insult the gods somehow? This is the mindset of the people. And Moses comes along and God, and God instructs him, no, this is exactly what is pleasing to me and this is what's not pleasing to me. God takes the guesswork out of faith. Whereas all of the people were, were just aimless, blindly going through the operation of their religion. And God changes that. So when the Yeshua comes on the scene, there is one enemy left to be conquered to show that he is sovereign, that God, his father, is sovereign over. You know what it is. Death. Death. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. God has proven himself to be sovereign over all the gods in this narrative. And in 1 Corinthians 15, we see the reason why Yeshua was lifted up on that cross and raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, all fa false authority and power, that is. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that he will de destroy is death. Jesus will gain all power of his father and the authority of his father. And he will turn that authority back over to his father after the millennial reign. But only after God has proven that he is sovereign over everything. And the last enemy of our soul, the last enemy to be destroyed, was death. There are people who still worship death on the planet today. And Jesus proved that he is sovereign over death. God is sovereign over death. 
Amen? Amen. So today's lesson really is about how do we operate in God's authority like the Maccabees and do it counting it all joy. Even in the face of that type of uh, the, the potential of death, that type of adversity, we count it all joy, as Yaakov put it. You may better know it as James. Turn with me to the book of James. The book of James. How many know that the book of James was named after King James, that Jesus' brother was named Yaakov? Yaakov. If you didn't know that, you know it now. See, we've lost so much in translation. Yaakov, verse 1 of James, chapter 1. Yaakov, a bondservant of God and the Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings, my brethren. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let the patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. Count it all joy. Listen to the words of Judas, Maccabeus, to his soldiers. Facing numbers vastly greater than his own, he said this, recorded by Josephus. Oh, my fellow soldiers, no other time remains more opportune than the present for courage and contempt of dangers. For if you now fight manfully, you may recover your liberty, which, as it is a thing of oneself agreeable to all men, so it proves to be mu as much more desirable by its affording us the liberty of worshiping God. Let me put that in my own words. Fighting for liberty is in and of itself a great thing for a man, a man to do. But when it comes to worship God, to be able to be free, to be liberated in order to worship God in the way he desires, that's even greater. Now I know that this is, this is part of the reason why I had such a, 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 a burden about that last election and why we fought so hard to encourage ourselves to vote. We, have, we are free men and women in this country to do it through a vote. At the point of the Maccabees, there was nothing left to do but risk their lives in fighting for liberty to worship their God. And what Yaakov or James is saying here when he says, count it all joy. He's saying to think or to believe or regard as joy. But the Greek word here used in, in James' writing, to record James' writing, the Greek word in, as a verb means to believe or to regard as. As a noun, the same word means to lead, to command with official authority. Same word. The, this, is, this book was written as more than just encouragement to the believers in Yeshua of his day. You see, he wanted them to understand, to walk, to lead their congregations with authority, to lead them with courage. You see, faith, is, the word for faith is imuna in the Hebrew, and it means faithfulness. More so than just a, it's not, it's, a, it's an action, it's a verb, it's doing, it's living it out and living according to Jehovah's instruction and being able to demonstrate a joyful contentment even in the midst of tragedy and great odds against us. A perfect example of this word is found in Acts chapter 7. Turn with me to Acts chapter 7. And if you're, if you can... Hopefully follow me on this. If not, listen to the YouTube video and search these things out yourself afterwards. Acts chapter 7. Beginning at the end of verse 8, and I particularly start here at the beginning uh, or the end of verse 8 because we're studying the life of Jacob right now, Yaakov. Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. 
And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Yosef or Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of his trouble and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now, why did I read that? Because that word there for governor, your Bible might say leader, it might say something else. But the Greek word there is the same word that James uses, counted all joy. And I said, as a noun, it means to lead officially or uh, to lead officially with authority. Joseph never gave up. Joseph was thrown, it was sold into slavery, thrown into prison, and never gave up and was raised, elevated to this position. And that same word there, to lead with official authority. The Maccabees led with authority from the word of God. And that same word is used again. You don't have it there, but if you had the first, first the book of Maccabees, chapter 9, verse 30, you'd see the same word again in the Greek used when authority was being passed down to the next generation among the Maccabees. The same word. See, it's the same thing that has led the Jewish people to hold on for over 2,000 years before Jerusalem was reunited. It's the same authority that they find in the word of God to say that, no, this land is ours. Jerusalem is our eternal capital. And they held on to that for to almost 2,500 years until we saw the reunification and rededication of Jerusalem in 1967. You see the faith, faithfulness, and understanding where their authority comes from? Their authority doesn't come from the UN. Their, our authority doesn't come from the UN. Our authority comes from the Word of God. And we can apply this to our lives, basing these promises on, in our own lives, that if God said it, it's all the proof I need. That's the authority. It's, it's the analogy I've used, shared with, this, with some of you this analogy of rowing a boat. If I'm going that direction, I'm sitting in a boat facing this way as I row. And I don't have to keep looking over my shoulder to see where I'm going. I can, I can go with confidence knowing from where I've been where I'm going. It's looking back at the word of God, the authority that we have. He's already said it. It's done. We can look at his authority and know that we are heading in the right direction because he's said it. We're walking in his authority. Amen. So how, how can we apply it for us today? Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Do you know, I will say this, that the redemptive story, this is a quote from Abraham Joshua Heschel. I wish it was my own. The redemptive story. Man needs redemption. Redemption is necessary for man. But man is necessary for redemption. You follow that? Redemption is necessary for man, but man is necessary for redemption. God has used his people throughout time to accomplish the plan of redemption. The Jewish people would have disappeared from the face of the planet, and Yeshua would have had no one to come through, no temple to walk in, had not man stepped up and done his bidding, his, his, his will on the earth. And it's the same for us. Ephesians chapter 6 if there was no need for fighting, why would we be told to put on the spiritual armor? What need is there for armor if there is no fight? Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the, e the evil day 
and having done all to stand, to stand. See yourself as a remnant. See yourselves as ones who will stand, who will put on the spiritual armor every day. Know that the fight is upon us. The battle is on us. We're in it. And that we have to stand and we have to fight. Be the remnant, remnant of God in every generation. He has used to continue his plan. I believe we're probably out of time. Next week, I'm going to talk about this restoration process, the rededication process. And maybe we'll get into more about Jerusalem itself. But until then, stand in his might. Walk in the authority that God has given you. He has spoken it in his word. If you know his word, you know what to do. Like the sons of Issachar who knew what they ought to do in their day. You know what to do. God bless you. Hallelujah.